accidentally hit this, this that billboard. Now that is not sin. Now sin is looking again to the Father. So it is not sin. It is not sin to be tempted, to fall into temptation. You see, in such a young person, this age you are in, you will face temptation. But through Christ, you can be able to overcome. Let's pray one more time as we begin. Remember, across the week, we are talking about the days of heaven upon the earth. Shall we begin? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. As you open its pages, open our understanding. As you study the written word, lead us to Christ, who is the living word. And Father, we pray that we will turn our attention and affection from the earthly and vain towards the heavenly and divine. This is our prayer. Make it our experience in Jesus' name. Uh, you know, in everything in life, uh, it, is, uh, it is good to look at the big picture. I remember uh, uh, growing up, uh, we had a library in our house. And that, in essence, cultivated in us a, a, a desire to, to read. My mom, uh, you know, made a, a, a library in our home so we could always go there, you know, and read. And I remember one of uh, the books in the library was about one of the most popular British historical figures. He was a real historical figure. He was working uh, with... Uh, Scotland Yard, which is an university uh, get you, uh, department. And so he was a dis detective. He's a man who goes by the name Sherlock Holmes. So there was that book of Sherlock Holmes. So he's a guy that even today, if you go on Netflix, you would find a lot of films made about his life, though most of them extensively exaggerated, but still there are some aspects of truth uh, in those films. He's one of the best detectives in history it was called Sherlock Holmes. So in, in, in the book in our home, entitled The Detective, uh, which contained more like historically accurate accounts of his life, there was this time, Sherlock Holmes had a best friend, and the best friend was a physician. He was called Dr. Watson. So there's a time Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went for camping. And so when they go for camping, they are sleeping inside a tent. And when they are sleeping inside a tent, Sherlock Holmes is abruptly interrupted from his sleep at 3 a.m. So he wakes up at 3 a.m. and then he pats Watson on the shoulder and uh, tells him, Watson, Watson, wake up. And so Watson also wakes up. So the two of them are awake. And then Sherlock tells uh, Watson, can you look up? And Watson looks up, and then Watson, uh, Sherlock Holmes says, what do you see when you look up? And Watson says, I see stars and stars and numerous stars. And Sherlock asks him, what does the stars tell you? What does the stars tell you? What does it tell you? And Sherlock Holmes, uh, Watson, I mean, Dr. Watson, he was a man of quite many learning. He was a polymath in so many fields in life. And so he looks at the stars and he, uh, he, at the reflection of the question Sherlock had asked him, what does the stars tell you? And so he begins by saying, quote unquote, orologically, it tells me that it is about 3 a.m. in the morning. Cosmologically, it tells me that the stars belong to a bigger solar system. Mathematically, it tells me that the light from the stars traveling at 186,000 kilometers per hour take about eight seconds to reach the Earth. Geologically, it tells me that the stars are made up of rotating rocks. Chemically, it tells me that the stars that you see are made up of the light gases of helium and hydrogen. Theologically, it tells me it is impossible for the stars to be there by accident, but rather they are there by design or by creation. Scientifically, it tells me that it is possible for men in the future to send subtle 
spaceships to reach and climb on the stars. And so he finishes his answers, he feels proud of himself, and he looks to Sherlock Holmes. And then he says, and you, Sherlock, what does the stars tell you? And Sherlock gives him a third on the forehead and says to him, you idiot, can't you tell somebody stole our tent? You know, <laughs> you know if you are sleeping inside a, inside a tent and you wake up at night and you can see the stars, the first alarm should be the tent is missing, right? Not whether the stars are made up of hydrogen and helium, right? That should be the first thing. So there's always what is called the bigger picture. Now most times, Christians always also focus on the minute instead of the magnitude. So there's a magnitude that God wants us to see. But then most times, just like Dr. Watson, the focus is more on the minute. And the same happens with the relationship. There are the magnitudes, the things, the mega things that God wants us to see. But most times we are busy focusing on the small things. And the study today is a continuation of the study yesterday. And today we'll just look at a few principles again, build up on what we saw yesterday. And then in about 20 minutes, we should be able to, to wrap this up. And so today I begin from point number four. So point number one yesterday, we said you have to consider whether it is God's will. And point number two, we said you have to ask whether it is the right time. And point number three, we said you have to seek counsel. Remember that. And now point number four, we say you have now to initiate or start uh, the relationship. And so today I want us to look at some of the things that we consider in a person, in a prospective person, a prospective man or a gentleman. You know, sometimes you, you, you hear people talk about what they want in a man and you, or a lady and you are, they leave a lot uh, to be desired. Sometimes you hear like, you know, a, a man, a lady, a lady would say, you know, they need tall, dark and handsome, right? And it's actually a phrase that runs across. And of course, the men usually say short, petite and portable, right? So it's also another phrase uh, that runs around. But you know, they, there's more than short, petite and portable. There's more than the tall, dark and handsome to look. Now, allow me to begin by establishing a principle. Go with me to the book is Proverbs chapter 19 verse 14. A well known verse. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 14. Proverbs 19 14. It says house and riches, it says that, right? Are the inheritance of fathers. And a prudent wife is from the Lord. Now, allow me to show you something interesting. Now, according to that verse, does a good wife or a good... Does a good wife come from God? Let me ask it that way. According to that verse, can God give somebody a good wife? It's true, right? But do you know the opposite is also true? Because, you know, that verse is very specific. A prudent wife, right? Other version says a good one, right? Now, where do the bad one come from? Where do they come from? Now, let me show you something interesting. Go with me to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Allow me to read first because of time. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemies. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and we are told, and his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Now, after the mouth of a lion, I want you to see these words. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, according to that verse, or according to understanding of prophecy, who is the dragon? Satan, right? Now, according to that verse, can the 
Satan gives somebody power. Hmm? So there are people who have power but it is from Satan. Now according to that verse, can Satan give somebody a seat? He can. Can he give somebody a great authority? Now, can the devil also give somebody a wife or a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Hmm? He can do that. That's why the Bible is very clear. A prudent wife. It puts the distinction. There. That therefore means the person you may be dating today did not necessarily come from the Lord, right? And sometimes you just see it by yourself, right? And, and you just know by the way there is no way this could have come from the Lord. So the very first step when you begin to search or you begin to initiate the process of a relationship would then to, uh, to ask God to give you that person to lead you to that person. That is the very first step. It is important to know that. It is very important because not every relationship is blessed of heaven. So it is therefore important to have a relationship and to be a partaker of a relationship that is blessed of God. The other thing, after committing to God to lead you, that you need to look at are two important fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, go, let's go to a verse we read yesterday. We can read it one more time. Galatians. Galatians. Chapter 5. We read this. Verse 17, where it contrasts the work of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Now the works of the flesh, verse 19, Verse 19, I mean, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are this, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lust, viciousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So I want us to focus there. There are two things I want us to see in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The first fruit is love, right? And the last fruit is temperance. Right? Love, meekness, faith, then gentleness, goodness, uh, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, then temperance. Now, I want us to look at those two. So, you must also consider somebody who is loving. Now, love, most people don't understand how it is expressed. You know, uh, the, the Greek language for which the New Testament was written was very specific. Now, in the Greek, if a mother loved a child, or a father loves a child, a love between a parent and a child, they used to call that storge. So it was very clear, storge. Now, if a brother loved a, a Christian brother, or a sister loved a Christian sister, or a Christian brother, a Christian sister, or just love between friends, they used to call that phileo. And then there was the romantic love. If a man romantically loves a woman and vice versa, they used to call that eros. And then there was the highest form of love. That is unconditional love where God loves man and that was called agape. So in the Greek mind, love was very distinctive in terms of its expression and the words used. But you know, like in today's world and even in our country, you know, here in Kenya, Somebody will say, I love that man, and then he will say, I love that dog, and you know, it almost will be with the same intensity and genuineness. And you know, so you can't even put a, a distinction on the depth and the breadth of love. So love is expressed in three ways. So when you look at, you know, somebody, is he loving, is she loving, love is expressed in three ways. And the most obvious of this is if you love me, Keep my commandments. So love is expressed through obedience. And so you must see whether they are obedient. Now, this is an important principle. I don't have even time to explain this verse, but it's a beautiful verse. Go with me to Luke 16, 12. I'll just explain it in a hurry because of time. Luke 16, 12. This is the parable of the unfaithful steward. Notice what it says. And if he have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Now, Jesus says, 
Faithfulness in your own place or in your own life is determined by faithfulness in other spheres. So what essentially Christ is saying, if you want God to give you a house, a home, a marriage, a relationship of your own, he says, if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's. So another man's in this case is your parents' house. You don't show obedience in your parents' house. Jesus then says, how can you be given a house, a home of your own? And so certain times how to judge whether people are loving rightly is to see their behavior in their parental home. Whether they are obedient from the homes they come from. Let me tell you something. A young man who disrespects his mother, there is no miracle that will make you, make him to respect you as the girlfriend or as the wife. It has to begin from the home. If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? And likewise, if you find a young woman who is not obedient to the parents or from the parental home she comes from, there is... No miracle that will make her to be a submissive and a diligent wife in your home. And so, when you look at love, you have to look, are they obedient to the home or the parents from where they come? So love is expressed, one, through obedience. And you have to look at it through that angle. Number two, love is expressed through responsibility. Now, let's say, you go back to, to your house, huh? or your mother's house, your father's house, and you go back and there are dirty utensils. And your mom says, wash the utensils. And you wash the utensils. You go ahead and wash the utensils. Your response to that is called obedience, right? You obey what they say. Now, you may go home, your mother may t not tell you to wash the utensils, but then you say by there, these utensils, they should be clean, right? And so you decide to wash utensils of your own accord, right? And now, that is the difference between obeying and being responsible. And so the second expression of love is through responsibility. Are they people who take up responsibility? Are they people who delight to be responsible? So when you look at love, it must be all-encompassing. It must be all encompassing. So you must be look whether they are you must look whether they are obedient to the parents, and you must also look if they are responsible. There are people who, when you know they they, they come, uh, you know, uh, typically uh, I, I work Monday to Friday, and there's a way we've divided responsibilities in um, in our home with my wife, and uh, uh, she does most of uh, the home duties. I, I do most of uh, the provision. But it always so happened that somehow on Sunday I'm always at home. And maybe you find, you know, there are utensils we used uh, on Saturday, for example. Saturday night after church and that. And maybe on Sunday morning. And you know, sometimes she comes back from work. Uh, she's a medical lab scientist. Uh, she comes back from work as maybe as late as 9 p.m. Now, I want you to imagine if uh, I would be waiting for her to come back wash the utensils, then begin cooking all again. You know, you'd almost sleep past midnight. So there are areas where even as a man, a sense of responsibility should tick in. Say, by the way, you know, you've been here in the house the whole day, there are dirty utensils. So responsibility would move you to do that. And let me tell you something. One of the most constant things in life is human character. People rarely change unless they are changed by God. Eh? So if you have a, a, a stingy boyfriend now, he will be a stingy husband. Eh? <laughs> there is no miracle that will, that, that, that will do it. You know, there is no miracle. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you. So human character is, is usually consistent. Is usually consistent. And so at the dating phase, when you court, is when you ought to identify. Are these people who are responsible. So we move from love shown through obedience, love shown through responsibility, and then we go now duty. The third expression of love is duty. 
And in this case, I would call it spiritual duty. As you look for a man and a woman to be in a relationship with, as I said before, they must have a spiritual grounding in God. That all of you must have some knowledge of God, then bring it together and grow together. You know, in the book Adventist Home, page 456, paragraph 2, quote and quote, listen to what Spirit of Prophecy says. The tendencies of the natural heart are downward. He who associates with the skeptic will soon become skeptical. He who keeps the companionship of the vile will most assuredly become vile. You know, the tendencies of the natural heart, they are downward. To mean, it is easy to do good, is easy to do evil than to do good, right? You know, there are certain sins you, I commit, you commit. Nobody ever took you through a training of those sins, right? But you do them, right? You know, there are those sins, you know, it is inward, the, the carnal nature. The tendencies of the natural heart are down. You know, there, there are those sins that even sometimes you do them, even sometimes the, the devil sits back and he says, Atta your style, Miss Diana. And somehow, you know, I have been in this business for 6,000 years, but that style that that daughter of God is doing, I've never seen. So, you know, it is most, it is easy to fall than to rise in life. So, assume the pulpit here, somebody is standing on the pulpit, so that they are like on a higher spiritual plane, and somebody is down here where I am standing, and they are pulling one another. Is it easy for the person up to go down or from the person down to go up? Up to go down. And that is why even, you know, an aeroplane uses most force and most fuel during taking off. Because generally it is harder to go up from below. But it is so easy to fall. Now the same happens with the spiritual life. If you have somebody, for example, where you are on a higher spiritual plane and they are on a lower spiritual plane, then it is more easy for you who think you stand to fall than even for them to come up. So love is also expressed in terms of taking up spiritual duty and having a spiritual devotional lifestyle full of prayer and full of Bible study. And actually, you know, if you've, uh, you've been praying, you know, once before you enter into a relationship, divine counsel says you should pray twice as much. So you must be with somebody who takes up spiritual uh, duty. So love is shown in those three facets. Now let's go to temperance and other things that you ought to look at. So we've seen love and how to look at it on a three-dimensional level. And now I want us to look at temperance. Another key thing, and you will see how this is key. Now again, temperance is shown in 3D as well. Temperance is shown in 3D. Ecclesiastes 7.9. Let's go with me there. Ecclesiastes 7.9. Uh, what's the time? Kindly? What's the time? According to your watch? 7.39. Okay. 10 more minutes. Ecclesiastes 7.9. It says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. So point number one is temperance with emotions. The person must have, be able to control his or her emotions. Now that is important. Why? Because it is sometimes lack of self-control in terms of emotion such as anger that leads to things like domestic violence in many homes. So if you are to avoid that in the future, the person you are interested right now, they must show temperance in their emotions. Look how, when they are angry, how do they respond? You know, uh, when, you are, when we got married with my wife, we made a decision that we will never, according to the Bible, the way the Bible says, huh? let not the sun set upon thy wrath. Huh? We made a decision we will never go to bed angry with each other. And so there's this day we were angry with each other and we stayed until 5 a.m. <laughs> and then, you know, we, we just started to, you know, we were going to work the next day. <laughs> We just had to come together. We had to, to pray and to ask each other for forgiveness and to catch maybe a, a quick one-hour nap before we could leave. 
So if see when somebody are ang- when somebody is angry, see how they respond. That is really important. That will determine that whether you will suffer emotional abuse or physical abuse in that place or in that relationship. So they must have a tempered anger. Even they may get angry, but they can control themselves. They can bring themselves to speak up, to open up about what they are going through. So temperance come one, temperance with emotions. You must be temperate about your emotions. So when you are looking for somebody to, to start a relationship with, see how they react when they are angry. If there are people who are easily annoyed when something happens. So number one is temperance and emotions. The second way temperance is exercised is through control of sexual desires. And this is important. Go with me to uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. So it must be temperance also about, you know, sexual urges. It says in flee fornication. For every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication, the Bible says, sinneth against his own body. So one of the things you must master as a man before you enter into a relationship is you must have mastery of your passions and your desires. Because if you fail to do that, then it means you will break the law of purity or the law of chastity. And you know, inspiration says, chastity and charity are the most precious gift in the eyes of God. So chastity, which is purity, you can only be able to control yourself uh, in a relationship if you mastered to control yourself even before entering a relationship. And you know, it's something that is a lifelong lesson. Uh, to share with you. You know, even when you get to marriage, you know, uh, th- there are days for one reason or another, your partner may tell you you may not be intimate. And you must learn to be able to control yourself and not force yourself. Because, you know, uh, research shows that sometimes even there is what is called marital rape. It happens. So there must be a control of your passions, of your desires the moment you begin to contemplate. So it's, it's, it may not be an easy thing, but it's something that with time and through the grace of God, you can learn. So temperance again. So it said one is emotions. Temperance now again is passions. You must be temperate with your passions. And lastly, which is also important, is with diet and with food. It's also important, and you'll see how that is significant in relationship. Before we read a verse, let's read another verse. Let's go with me to 1 Corinthians 9.25. It says, And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do this to win a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. So it says, you must learn. Temperance must be the pervading thing. You know, from your emotions to your passions, you know, even to your reading, uh, you know, everything has to be temperance, and especially with the food. You know, there are people, they will only know when they are satisfied if they are eating and they are struggling to breathe. They'll eat until they begin struggling to breathe, now is when they'll now stop, you know. Now, you must cultivate a spirit of temperance, even with food. And I'll tell you how that plays an important part. Go with me to Proverbs uh, 23. When thou sittest, verse 1 and 2, to eat with a ruler, consider diligently, when thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. And then he says, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to what? Appetite. If thou be a man, given to appetite. So, temperance. You know, because certain times, you know, right from the relationship phase, uh, temperance in diet will determine even the homemaking skills in your home. It will determine the food you people will eat. And it will also determine, you know, the type of food your children will eat. 
You know, uh, today, uh, most diseases are caused by lifestyle diseases. And uh, lifestyle diseases, one of the leading causes of cancer, for example, is obesity. Now, there are people sometimes who erroneously teach that sugar causes cancer. There is no such thing in medicine. Now, what, uh, what happens is, uh, you know, uh, when you uh, put on uh, more weight, sugar, sugar adds weight, generally. That's why people, nowadays, there's a craze to avoid wheat and anything related to carbs, because sugars add weight. Now, when you have uh, a lot of weight, then it predisposes you now to cancers, diabetes, hypertension. But there is no direct correlation. You know, you know the, the, sometimes you meet Adventists who say they don't use sugar because it causes cancer. You know, uh, you may be genuinely ignorant. So, the the thing is, it it does not, but it's it it a cascading effect. So, the type of food you eat in your home will determine the lifestyle. You, you, you have in your home. And so it is important even to agree on those principles right way before you enter there. During the courtship phase, those are certain things. So temperance in diet. And uh, those who have even studied it at a further level, you'll realize things like food sometimes even affect fertility. For example, there are foods, especially high lipid uh, foods, uh, that directly linked with you know low chances of fertility, both in men and women. So it is important to be able to learn to be temperate, because sometimes it is. Allow me to show you something important. Go with me to Genesis 25:29. We're reading King James version and uh, please always I know as much as sometimes we project the Bible here, uh, always carry your Bibles. You know believe me you, uh, there's nothing as musical to the preacher's ears than the turning of the pages of the scripture so don't deny us such simple joys. Eh? So always just carry carry a Bible with you. And Jacob saw the portage and Esau came from the field and he was faint and Esau said and to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red footage, for I am faint. Then we are told, therefore, was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said unto him, swear unto me this day. And he swear unto him. And Jacob, it ends, that chapter ends by saying, and Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. And then it ends by saying, thus Esau despised his birthright. So there we see Esau's big problem was um, lack of control of appetite. And when his lack of control of appetite, you know, he, he reasons, listen to what he tells his brother. Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And it's an excuse people always make every time they want to sin, you know. So maybe those outside there, sometimes you, you may even look for an attachment that maybe requires you to, to work on Sabbath. And then, uh, you know, you, you reason like Esau. Behold, you know, I am at the point to miss the marks for attachment. What profit shall the Sabbath do? do to me. So most times we always find an excuse. So the problem that Esau had in Genesis 25, 29, all the way to 34, was the problem of lack of control of appetite. Now I want you to see how Paul records the same story. Go with me to Hebrews 12, 16. Hebrews 12, 16. It says, lest there be any what? What is the word there? Fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one more sale of meat sold his birthright. You know, in, if you read in Genesis, we see just lack of temperance. But when Paul writes about him, he calls him a fornicator. Then how then is lack of control in food related to fornication, which is passions? It is because sin mostly does not happen immediately. Sin always has what is called a creeping compromise. You begin small. And you know, by the, the first time you commit any sin, unakonga the most guilty. Sin. 
the next time you feel less guilty senyo the third time you feel less guilty the fourth time you begin to rationalize it why it is not even such a bad thing to do you know it's just like maybe you know uh, if, if you've ever traveled along PSV especially easy matatu za Nairobi ama za wapi there are days the conductor would forget kukuliza change eh? and so akulizi and then wewe pia au peani sio and then ukitoka kwa gari unasema hata wao wamewahi enda na pesa yako sio so you know that is how sin always work it begins with guilt 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 then rationalization so as sin life of sin began with just lack of control of appetite but eventually led even to the sexual sin of fornication so anybody who cannot control his appetite basically what those two verses shows cannot control every other aspect of temperance so that is why it is therefore so important that when you are looking for a person a friend uh, to begin a relationship with you must look at love in 3d look at it in terms of obedience look at it in terms of duty look at it in terms of responsibility and also come to temperance look at it in terms of emotions look at it in terms of passions and look at it in terms of appetite for food so all those must be well balanced now it is important uh, to know that god also uh, love is not just about the qualities now there is a No it, it is good to be honest about, honest about some of these things right so there are qualities but there are also quantities to love so there are spiritual values but there are also physical so it is actually even a sin to date somebody you are not physically attracted to you know have you ever seen a daughter of god you know when the bible says about daughters of god or a woman it says the lord <laughs> they were made from adam's rib and the rib which the lord had taken from the man made he a woman right and so most times you see daughters of god nyewe you see they are wonderfully made right most times than not most times in just a few exceptions right but <laughs> but most times than not the daughters of god are wonderfully made now you know men men were not made men were created right and they were not created <laughs> and they were not created from a soft rib such as eve they were created from rough dust right and so most times you, you will always meet a son of god eh? <laughs> and they look more fearfully made than wonderfully made <laughs> you, you you would see that you know <laughs> and and so physical attraction has a part in a love so as much as you look for these qualities it does not mean you should force yourself to somebody you are not physically attracted to are we together it must be there so all of these things both the physical and the intrinsic both the external and the internal must be well balanced and you know that's by the that's the principle of life let's say if you are doing house hunting for your uh, hostel and maybe you see a, a house that is roughly patched and you know maybe with uh, uh, brown Uh, iron coated roofs you know maybe a poor sewerage system most times you will not even go inside to find out what is there right most times for you to go inside and see what is there the outside must first be appealing so the outside attracts the inside retains and that is how it is also that sometimes it may begin with a physical attraction but as you know them better you then realize even their values are godly values are you together so it's not just about the physical qualities it also has to do with the spiritual both spiritual qualities and physical qualities so all of those must be well balanced so it is my prayer that you consider the message that we've had uh, today and as i said before some of these truths may not be relatable they may not seem agreeable but they are the principles found in the word of god and if we do follow them then deuteronomy 11:21 the days of heaven upon the earth may the lord bless you in jesus name Amen. <laughs> let's stand up for the final prayer Father in heaven we thank you for the word you've given us this evening and for teaching us of what we should look for and father though we've not exhausted in depth and breadth 
we thank you for what we've learned this evening. And we pray that the message we've had today may not only be for our information, but above everything else for our transformation. This is our prayer. Make our experience in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.